Page 14 of the Sutra book. Ehe koso hatsugan ma. We bow with all beings from this life on through our countless lives to hear the true Dharma that upon hearing it no doubt will arise in us nor will we lack in faith that upon meeting it we shall renounce worldly affairs and maintain the Buddha Dharma and that in doing so the great earth and all living beings together will attain the buddha way although our past evil karma has greatly accumulated indeed being the cause and condition of obstacles in practicing the way may all buddhas and ancestors who have attained the buddha way be compassionate to us and free us from karmic effects allowing us to practice the way without hindrance may they share with us their compassion which fills the boundless universe with the virtue of their enlightenment and teachings buddhas and ancestors of old were as we we in the future shall be buddhas and ancestors revering buddhas and ancestors we are one buddha and one ancestor awakening bodhi mind we are one bodhi mind because they extend their compassion to us freely and without limit we are able to attain buddhahood and let go of our attainment Therefore, the Chan Master Lungya said, those who in past lives were not enlightened will now be enlightened. In this life, save the body, which is the fruit of many lives. Before Buddhas were enlightened, they were the same as we. Enlightened people of today are exactly as those of old. Quietly explore the farthest reaches of these causes and conditions, as this practice is the exact transmission of a verified Buddha. Repenting in this way, one never fails to receive profound help from all Buddhas and ancestors by revealing and disclosing our lack of faith and practice before the Buddha we melt away the root of transgressions by the power of our repentance. This is the pure and simple color of true practice, of the true mind of faith, of the true body of faith. Well, welcome everybody here in the Zendo and on Zoom in the United States and in Australia. As we're in uh, Zazenkai, a full day sit, I'd like to start with just a few uh, simple Zazen instructions. That when we're sitting, we have our body relaxed but awake. 
We have our chin, chin slightly tucked down because when our chin is up, we tend to think a lot. And I was just reflecting on that, that when our chin is up, it's like the energy behind our neck is blocked a little bit and we can more likely to get caught up in our, in our thoughts. The chin just slightly tucked down the energy can flow down our spine. But if the chin is too far down, it interrupts our breathing a little bit and we become sleepy. So it's something you can just notice throughout the day. Just check the tilt of the head. Sometimes it's described too, like there's a, a string pulling us up through the spine. So the chin is slightly tucked, but the spine is also still straight and upright. And we're very lucky in this zendo uh, to have such beautiful sounds. So our general practice is to um, be aware of our breathing. And we can combine being aware of our breathing with being aware of sounds. letting those sounds bring us back into the present moment. Our mind will drift into thinking. We can notice that it's drifted into thinking, bring it back to the breath and listen to the sounds. And just repeat that pattern over and over, kind of a mind training. A mind training, and also an expression of the teachings themselves. That the present moment is where everything happens. This is where all the fertility is. This is where all the power is in the present. If we uh, train our mind so that it naturally starts to function more in the present, our body follows and we're more skillful in the world. Our Zazen practice is both a mind training and uh, an embodiment itself of the teachings. There is a koan collection uh, in a book called Entangling, Entangling Vines. And uh, case 71 from this collection is Nan Tang's Other Realms. And it goes like this. In his 10 admonitions, Nan Tang Yuan Jing says, Work actively for the salvation of beings in other realms. In his 10 admonitions, Nan Tang Yuan Jing says, work actively for the salvation of beings in other realms. The ten, admi ten, ten admonitions um, are very beautiful. I want to go through them one at a time and then go back to the case itself. And the word admonition, we often think of as having a, a sort of a strong, a little bit negative connotation, like a reprimand, um, correction, an admonition. But it also can have uh, just a strong, a strong sense of advising or strong counsel, or maybe even sort of a warning or a gentle reproof. And I kind of like this word because in a way it's reminding us that it is so easy for us 
to think in deluded and dualistic ways. It's so easy for us to do that. Even after years of practice, we can still fall into delusive thinking, self-referencing thinking, alienated thinking, combative thinking, dualistic thinking so easily. We can slip into that. But our practice gives us the great capacity to notice when we do. This is one of the most beautiful things about our practice. We can notice when we forget that everything is one. When we forget, we can notice and then we can uh, confess to ourselves and aspire to do a little better the next time a circumstance arises that tempts us into dualistic thinking. So these are the 10 admonitions. I'll read them through and then go through each one. Number one, have faith that there is a separate te teaching transmitted outside the sutras. So have faith that there is a separate teaching transmitted outside the sutras. Two, attain a firm understanding of this separate transmission. Three, Know the unity of the Dharma teachings of the sentient and the Dharma teachings of the non-sentient. I'll just repeat that one. Know the unity of the Dharma teachings of the sentient and the Dharma teachings of the non-sentient. Four. See into your self nature vividly and clearly and be firm and steady in your step. Five, possess the discerning Dharma eye. Six, practice in such a way as you leave no traces, being firm in your commitment to the Dharma. Seven, achieve a balance of practice and understanding. Eight, destroy false doctrines and promote current correct ones. And I've just put in brackets there, in one's mind. And I want to make sure to speak a little bit about when we hear a teaching like this, destroy false doctrines and promote correct ones that sound kind of very combative, <laughs> very dualistic, destroy false doctrine. Is there a way that we can understand it that it is not dualistic? So we'll come back and look at that quite closely. Nine, possess great ability. Ten, work actively in the different realms of existence. Or as it's translated in the koan, work actively for the salvation of beings in other realms. 11. So the first one, have faith, have faith that there is a separate teaching transmitted outside the sutras. This is possibly one of the most uh, distinct characteristics of our Zen practice is this teaching that the true teachings are transmitted outside of the sutras, outside of the text, outside of words, outside of forms, outside of liturgy.
the teaching isn't saying that there is anything wrong with sutras or with studying or with analysis or contemplation or of offering incense or of doing vows. But transmission of the true teachings occurs outside of words. And in a way, what this is saying, well, not in a way, what this is saying for, is for each of us, we can realize the teaching ourselves in a split second. We can understand the teachings. And the reason that Zazen is such an important part of our practice and why we have day sits and why we have retreats, session, is because these create the perfect conditions or the ideal conditions for us to realize the teachings in our body, throughout our whole body. For us to realize with no doubt, with a great unshakable sense of uh, understanding, felt understanding, that there is no separate self. That there is no self. Everything is unified. Just this moment is where it's all happening. We can really realize that ourselves. The teachings can help us, help, help us, guide us, steer us, maybe corral us a little. But it's our Zazen practice, coming back to the breath, coming back to the sounds, trusting, having deep faith that each of us can do it, can understand the, understand the teachings fully for ourselves so that then when we say the words, they're our words when we say them. They're not somebody else's words. They become our words when we say them. And it doesn't have anything to do with how smart we are, how educated we are. What our personality is like. or our family of origin, or our culture, or our age. Or our physical capacity. It's available there for all of us. But it does require some faith. We have to have some faith that is possible and we have to turn ourselves toward it. So that's the first admonition. Have faith that there is a separate teaching transmitted outside the sutras. And then the second is to attain a firm understanding of this separate transmission. The way I hear that firm understanding is that our practice goes on for the rest of our life, every day, every moment of our life. We deepen our understanding. It becomes more grounded, firmer, not in a rigid type of firm, but as in we don't get knocked off our center. Even when something goes wrong, we don't get knocked off our center. Or when we get knocked off, we notice we've been knocked off and we can recalibrate and vow to do better the next mo in the next moment. So we take care of our understanding. And throughout practice, and some of you may have this experience, there can be a strong realization experience and then there are subsequent more experiences where you hear a teaching and you go, 
oh my gosh, I kind of get that now. I get that more now. I get that more. That happens for me quite a lot. I felt that I already had it to some extent and then I get it more. It sinks a little more deeply. So you need to take care of that. The best way to take care of our understandings is to do zazen and to connect with sangha and to be of service in the world in whichever way inspires us to be of service in the world. A few of us were having a conversation actually about this in the koan class uh, yesterday, that we don't have to go seeking any great distance to be of service, that if we're attentive to the present moment, opportunities to do service just arise right in front of us. We don't have to travel any great distance. But we might also travel great distance, but we don't have to travel great distance. Another way that we can take care of our understanding is to be in the company of wise people, people we respect, who we feel maybe have a bit of a deeper understanding than we do, to be in their company. Not necessarily to ask them lots of questions, but just to watch how they move their bodies, how they respond to people when people say hello to them. how they respond to people when somebody says, I don't like that. How do, you, how do they respond to that? We can just observe them. That's a way to take care of our own understanding. The third admonition is know the unity of the Dharma teachings of the sentient and the Dharma teachings of the non-sentient. So it speaks here about the unity of the teachings of both the sentient and the non-sentient. And again, maybe this is another particular quality of our Zen practice is strong attention attention to all sentient beings no matter how small or large or how far away or how close and attention to non-sentient beings rocks clouds rivers furniture, sounds, the sounds that we hear are calling to us. We'd say the birds are calling our name, they're calling to us. Wake up, wake up. One time in Santa Cruz, I was going for a run in a place I hadn't been before along the coast. And I imagined in my mind that it was going to be sort of pristine coastal shrubs, wind blown sort of cypress trees uh, with cliffs and the water crashing against the cliffs and pelicans flying past in formation because it's a lot like that in parts of California. And so I got there, headed out for my run, came across a crest, and all I could see in front was just fields of Brussels sprouts being grown. <laughs> just big Brussels sprout farming right up to the edge of the cliff. All that was between the edge of the cliff dropping into the ocean was the four wheel drive track for the tractors to go along and it was just Brussels sprouts. 
and I, I had this moment of disappointment, like, oh my God, it's just fields of Brussels sprouts being sprayed with chemicals. And I felt really disappointed for a, for a moment there. And then I just let myself recalibrate, just listen to the Dharma of the Brussels sprouts. Just, just let them be my teacher. And I ran for miles and miles along straight lines amongst the Brussels sprout fields. And it was so beautiful. It just went on for miles and miles. Sometime later, I would, would return there and run quite often. And uh, in the, I can't remember now if it was before the black summer fires here or after, but in the alternate season to the black summer fires in Australia were the big fires in California. And I went out to those fields and there was thick sort of smoke and every, the sky was this dark, orange colour and I felt really sad for the Brussels sprouts that they were having to deal with this kind of um, air for them to breathe that went on for days and days and days and days. And luckily the reason I was able to be there is the wind was blowing in off the ocean and just the first bit of land off the ocean the air was clear so I could run along the coast but all those other Brussels sprouts going in land we're all having to breathe in this smoky air. So if we uh, don't distinguish between sentient and non-sentient and value them, non-sentient and the sentient, allow them to teach us the chairs in the zendo here, the subutons, our, our rugs that we have. They can teach us to be here in the here and now, to be present and practicing, keeping our mind as much as possible in the present is all we need to do. When we do that, useful thoughts arise about problems that need to be solved. We don't have to actively try and solve problems. Things that are going to, that will be occurring in the present, but at the moment we can see them on the horizon. We can actually be most skillful with them by practicing just being here right now. And then when those things that we can imagine that are going to arrive when they are here in the present, we deal with them better. So we always have objects around us. We might not always have a lot of sentient life around us, but we have non-sentient life around us all the time inside our houses, inside our cars when we're driving, in buildings. So we can know the unity of the Dharma teachings of both the sentient and the non-sentient. And I think most of us here already have a sense of within the band of sentient beings that even the smallest, what seem most insignificant, are just as valuable as the great big animals and so on that we more easily identify with that we can be careful when we're walking, not only not to tread on little slaters or ants or worms, but to let them teach us. It's been raining a lot here and um, probably everyone here has noticed that when it rains a lot, the worms don't want to get kind of drowned in the water saturated soil. So 
they do what they've evolved to do. They look for a little rock to climb onto. But here, it's a big paved road that they wriggle onto and they don't generally probably understand that by the time the rain has stopped and they keep on wriggling to get off the other side of that rock that they'll get dried out on the road or they'll get run over by a car. So if we see that, we might not be able to pick them all up because sometimes there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, but we can pick a few of them up and just pop them back into the grass. And just remembering that they have a life just like us. That they're wanting to stay alive, that they've got plans for the day in their own way. They can be a mindfulness bell for us while we're walking along and we see a few of the worms and we think, oh, but I'm running late. <laughs> I don't want to have to stop for a moment. We can say, well, I actually, I am running late, so I'm not going to stop. So we can do that and have a little bit of humility that we just couldn't find the strength to give that time to those worms. Or we might say, hold on a second. I can just, I'll just move three move three of them. The fourth, oh my gosh, the fourth uh, admonition, see into your Buddha nature vividly and clearly and be firm and steady in your step. See into your Buddha nature vividly and clearly and be firm and steady in your step. When we see vividly and clearly into our Buddha nature, we do walk more firmly and steadily in our mind as well as in our body, particularly in our mind. Buddha nature pervades the whole universe, existing right here now. Nothing is excluded. Probably one of the most important teachings for me is this teaching that nothing is excluded. No matter what anybody has done or what anybody thinks or what any plant or animal has done or what it thinks, Buddha nature pervades the whole universe. If we can really let that sink into us, there's a lot less troubles in our mind because nobody's alien to us. When we see someone doing something that we might assess, maybe very accurately so, that what they're doing is incredibly harmful, we don't hate them for it. We don't hate them at all for it. We simply have to just come back to the present and say, what is the appropriate response now? What, what can I do now? That's all we have to do. So we have a lot more energy because we're not filled with animosity or even just mild, mild animosity. We don't even have that. Just work out what, what, what can I do? If, is there something for me to do? What, what would that be? The fifth admonition is possess the discerning Buddha eye. I just think that's a good idea. <laughs> Nothing more to say about that. <laughs> Six. Practice in a way, in such a way as you leave no traces, being firm in your commitment to the Dharma. And I've read this little bit before, but I'll just read it again because it's a lovely example of leaving no trace, but having, 
having an effect, leaving no personal trace. This is in the pre preface of Suzuki Roshi's book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Suzuki Roshi with, was with us in America only 12 years, but they were enough. Through this, through this work of this quiet, small man, there is a thriving Soto Zen organization on our continent and now in Australia. His life represented the Soto way so perfectly that the man and the way were merged. His non-ego attitude left us no eccentricities to embroider upon. Though he made no waves and left no traces as a personality in the worldly sense, the impress of his footsteps in the visible world of history leads straight on. It's leaving no trace is another way of saying when we function less from uh, an ego referencing place, when we function in the world feeling intimate with things, feeling connected with things, when we function that way, we leave no personal trace. Our, person, our, our personality is still there, but our sense of ourself is uh, it's kind of transparent, it's thinner, and it doesn't have an impact. It's much more refreshing for people. So we can leave no trace by gently having less self-concern. The seventh, achieve a balance of practice and understanding. Yeah, achieve a balance of practice and understanding. So this is a good instruction that sometimes we sit a lot and don't read very much, maybe don't study very much. Other times we may, maybe study a lot. Maybe we study a lot and we don't sit so much. Just a little bit risky, but it's possible to do. Sometimes we contemplate a lot, really engage with the teachings. Write, read ask questions and other times we just sit and maybe at other times we're embodying the teachings more in our actions we're being of service and that's maybe primarily what we're doing for a period of time doing a lot of service next week we we'll, we have five day rohatsu session and there will be people here who will be doing a lot of service They'll be looking after things, helping things run smoothly and seamlessly. And then after they can get to rest and not have to be of service for a little while. Eight, destroy false doctrines and promote correct ones. So as I mentioned earlier, when we come across a teaching that feels a little jarring to us, what I always do is see if I can read between the lines, like what's not being said. So in this one, what's not being said for just the sake of brevity is in our minds, not in other people's minds. We don't go around trying to destroy what we think are false doctrines in other people's minds. <laughs> That's not our way. It's not our way at all. We don't do that. But we do notice in our own minds when we're thinking dualistically and we encourage ourselves when that happens to go, oh, see if I can just come back to the breath for a little bit and see if a good idea comes to my mind. It's a little more harmonious. We just do that. Very simple practice. So even though it says destroy false doctrines, we don't have to think of it harshly. It's just a strong admonition to us. Pay attention to your own mind. Notice what you're doing, notice your patterns.
Number nine, possess great ability. So the more that we practice and have less self-concern and uh, feel more connected to everyone and everything, we actually do get more energy. We actually get more physical energy, we get more mental energy. And it's not that we have to have vast pools of energy to rush around doing a great deal of things, but our ability and our energy do are enhanced. Our abilities are enhanced. We find our own unique way of how we harness our abilities for the benefit of all beings. So this admonition, possess great ability, is in a way kind of helping us lean into this, this possibility for ourselves. We can lean into this, not underestimate ourselves. And the last one, work actively in different realms of existence. Or as it's said in the koan, work actively for the salvation of beings in other realms. So in a way, this connects a little bit to the earlier one about uh, the Dharma teachings of the sentient and the non-sentient. What are other realms? Are there actually other realms? Or are there just appearances of other realms? Are things really different to us or do they just appear different to us? And if we can work actively in our minds with seeing the similarity between ourselves and other things, even if they superficially seem very, very different, whether we're talking about ourselves and other people, ourselves and other species, or ourselves and objects, we can see a kind of sameness between ourselves and other objects, we can work actively for them as ourselves or for ourselves as them. We can move a chair respectfully. We can arrange our cushion respectfully. We can arrange our clothes respectfully. So I know we're just about out of time, but I did want to read one quick poem. It connects with this last admonition. It's called Guishan's Water Buffalo. Guishan Ling Yao addressed the assembly saying, when this old monk's 100 years are finished, I'll be reborn as a water buffalo at the believer's house by the foot of the mountain. On the water buffalo's lower left flank will be written my name. If you call it a monk from Mount Gui, it's still a buffalo. And if you call it a buffalo, it's still a monk. So tell me then, to get it right, what should you call it? Yang Shan Hui Ji stepped forward, bowed and walked away. So there's a story that um, in China, if you had debts that you couldn't pay and the debts were going to get left to your family, you could choose to be reborn as a water buffalo in the family of the person that you're in to the person you were indebted to. And then your family will just need to go to that person, see the mark on the flank of the buffalo and say, ah, that's our relative. We'll buy that buffalo from you and that will neutralize the debt, even if the debt was way, way bigger than the cost of a buffalo. And I kind of love that story because it, to me, it's like this beautiful way in which the buffalo is helping the people out. This buffalo, with, the, with our name on them, helps that family not be indebted because of the debt of one of their relatives. Maybe another time I'll talk at length about that case. But maybe that's enough for today. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, we'll finish with our closing chant and then everyone in the Zendo and those on Zoom, if they would like to, can get up and do the three full prostrations together before we do Kinhin. Mm -hmm.
some numbers. I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to become it. So now we have two hands that can move to use the restroom and get some of the water to the dry.
Thank <laughs> you. 